Hello, Pod Smashers, and welcome to another episode of 80 Bit Pod Smash, 80 Bit Pod Smash, where gaming goes to grab a beer. We're your hosts, Penguin and Termite. I am Penguin. I am Termite, and we are a weekly video game podcast, smashing together ideas that you care about with video games. That's right, and right now we are not only recording this on our recording software, but we are also live on Twitch. So some of you may have heard this already, in which case skip like 10 to 15 minutes ahead to get to our discussion about capitalism, if that's what you're here for. And if you are watching live on Twitch, then we're happy you're here. We're going to exchange some gifts and allow you all to be a part of this little bit of the show live so please please drop any comments questions concerns feedback in the chat so anyways that that is it is that all the housekeeping can we talk about uh what we're doing tonight so again we are talking about capitalism and our main topic that we've already recorded so skip ahead if you have already heard this or if you just don't want to listen to this. And then also we are going to be doing an ex- gift exchange where we are exchanging gifts that will take uh, it's our tradition and that will take up both favorite things and DLC um, because it will take a while to open the gifts. But we're going to open them. We've got gifts for each other. We're going to talk about why we got them for each other and what kind of criteria we used to make our decision. And then also this year we're doing something extra special. We are going to be putting some money in each other's names towards a charity as well. So we only mm-hmm. we we made an effort to only get one cheap gift and then the rest of the money that we budget towards that will go towards a charity in that we choose for the other person in their name. A little bit of background for that is usually we would use Black Friday to find like a really good deal. And we kind of set ourselves a budget for the price of a full a full price video game, which right. is like 60, maybe 70 now. So we would at least I would optimize to spend $60. And sometimes I could stack two or three games in there to take advantage of some of the sales. Well, we had to have a beef with Black Friday. And we go into that a little bit into our capitalism discussion, which you can fast forward and get to if you care about. But we have a little beef with the whole Black Friday sale thing. So we decided we will find one cheap gift. And then whatever the difference is to make up, we will donate the difference to a charity. So that's why we're doing that. Right. And I have the charity that I'm going to donate in your name ready to go here. Would you want to do that after the gift exchange? You I want to do that after, yes. So Yes, cool. I want to talk about mine because I, I, well, I want to talk about mine once we do the gift exchange. So I think because I can see the reflection in your glasses that we're on the same site. Oh, are we? That's funny. <laughs> Nice. All right, well, we'll just talk about that then. Yeah. And All right, anyways, so this is Termite's present to me, nice and wrapped. It's a video game. Obviously, that's what we get for each other. So my suggestion is I'm going to open mine first, and you'll talk about it. But please show everybody the gift that I wrapped for you. Oh, I had intended everyone to see this monstrosity. First of all, it's massive. (laughs) I need to turn off turn off some of my features here so let me turn these things off okay it's matt this is supposed to be a video game it's a video game it's wrapped in some avengers wrapping paper but very poorly poorly shredded and there's a piece of duct tape that is taping a piece of wrapping paper as if it were trying to cover a tear but it's just taped over a section that's already wrapped while there's tears and missing segments all over the place Absolutely. And then if you turn the present Beautiful. around, you can see a different wrapping paper and it's called some contact duct tape. paper. It's even better than wrapping paper. Uh, and the then, of course, like thing. about a third of the box is not wrapped at all. So you can see Beautiful. this monstrosity. When I get to open it, we'll have some more discussion. There is a I, green bow on top and there's I, some red ribbon around it. And I it's suggest- all duct taped and... <laughs> Yeah. I suggest you start opening it now because by the time you're done talking about my... Well, I have plans and we'll get there. So just go through yours. Just open yours. It'll be fun. Believe okay. me. Trust me. All right. I've termited this thing. It's all about termite. I mean, do you have like a knife? Because we're going to have to go fast. All right. I'll I'm get, opening get, present it, yeah. now. Yeah, do it. I'm opening it. It's a present. It's a video game. Oh, it's a PlayStation game. I, I was thinking that or an Xbox game maybe because of the size. Oh, it's by Square Enix. Why would I get you an Xbox game? I don't know. Trolling me? Or put it in That'd an be... Xbox case? Oh, trolling. that would be funny. That would have been funny, yeah. yeah. Then you'd be like, you know I have the case now. here. I'll get it to you later. <laughs> or I've given it to your wife. <laughs> what is it? What is it? Oh, what is it's it? Nero Replicant. It's the, Yay. the, pre, the, the original Nero, but remade version. Hold on, I'll read it. <clears throat> 
Near Replicant version 1.22474487139. Yes, you read I it. I really, really wanted this game, and I really, it came out at a time when there was a lot of games that I was not sure I wanted. And when all the dust settled, I wish I had just grabbed this game <laughs> at the time. But I'm glad you got it for me on sale, presumably. And mm-hmm. and uh, so how much do you donate into uh, uh, so a better ABK? <laughs> I saw the lowest price for that game, which is not the price that I paid for it. So we won't go how much I paid for it. But the lowest price I saw and should have paid for it was 15 So I will donate oh, $45. Wait, did to you make not up. pay that, though? I did not pay 15 okay. But that's my fault. All so right, I'm gonna I will eat that. Leave that upon <laughs> yeah. your better yeah. judgment. So. Yeah, it's fine. Fifteen, um, that's good. That would have been yeah. perfect. It would have been, but yeah. I'm still gonna donate um, forty five dollars. Should I go over the charity yet, or do we want to do that after As we're both? Since we're done? both doing it, we'll talk about what. Since we're both apparently doing the same one, we'll we'll we'll, we'll talk about it. Were there any other choices right now? though? Were you considering? No, we'll do it later. We'll do it after. I was I, wanna... I was about to do the research to ramp up. Like you'd sent me the link of all the list of charities, and like they kind of uh, hold them accountable. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. There's what, um. Huh? the word I'm looking for when you can see clearly into something transparency. visibility, transparency. transparency. Thank you. Yeah. Where they like go in and see how good these trans, these uh, charities really are. What are they doing? And I was about to do that. Cause you had done the research. You sent me the link. I appreciate that. Thank you. But then all of this news hit and Jessica Gonzalez of yeah. blizzard stood up a GoFundMe to help fund the salaries and life being paid salaries, if you will, like income of the Blizzard employees who are staging strikes, walkouts, and all the things. It's an official strike, and it's officially associated with unionization efforts. Yep. They're encouraging all employees to sign a union card. So, yes, a nascent union is being born, and there's a GoFundMe set up to, to support them. So go do that, and then we are going to be doing that for each other. And the um, links to these, the donations that we're doing here, the, the actual GoFundMe place will go in our show notes. You guys can follow along, and girls, please do that. Check it out. Do your research if you care at all about why we're, we're dropping our, our cash here. Yeah. But there was actually click. another charity I had chosen before this, but then this dip- this placed it. So, no, start open that present, man, because I promise okay. you, I promise you, you're going to want to start. And okay. now talk to me about why you chose Near Replicant while you're, while you're doing that. Oh, that's going to be hard because I need to talk about some other things while I do this. So if you remember, two months ago, I had pranked you on Twitch. Right. On Halloween. Yes. So I fully anticipate your repercussion the the, the blowback re- retribution thank you you're full of the words Revenge. tonight so i have i have come prepared so give me one sec to throw something on to protect myself <laughs> Ooh, this is better this is even better than i could have could have anticipated this is working out even better than i planned i can't hear you because my headphones aren't in good Okay, Good so I got a poncho. <laughs> okay, and I'm also going to have to distance myself from the computer because this thing, who knows what's in it? And I don't want my computer and my chair and my seat, you know, damaged. So I have another there. piece of plastic on the floor in a far empty corner that I hope this camera can see. I'm going to back away from the microphone, but I, I also have a razor blade and scissors Wise. that are brand wisdom. new wisdom and i'm i so i have to step away to open the present to get Go it away it. from anything that might be valuable because i don't know what explosions glitter bombs <laughs> etc could happen here so oh, man, it needs to go so in the back nice. corner i expected full retribution for okay, halloween fair, fair. so i you know expect the worst right and or prepare for the worst hope surprised for the if it's not as bad as you right expect. Yeah. yeah okay all right okay go so i am awkwardly going to open this over there not in my chair so you'll see Short, uh turn my background and i'll just i'll narrate i'll narrate for you since okay. you won't be able to hear i don't know how much the mic can pick up just keep talking start by cutting the ribbons okay, all right yeah he's here. gonna cut the ribbons now so my razor blade so i guess he can't hear me so i'm gonna explain what's going on there's not actually any like glitter but he has nothing to worry about it is a uh russian nesting doll situation basically i i wrapped more pre like more boxes inside that box there's like five or six boxes within a box within a box within a box and but here's the twist each one gets progressively better looking the further he goes down so it's gonna start with this terribly wrapped present looks like it was wrapped by a three-year-old the next one's gonna be like "Ah, okay good effort but not the best wrapped present of all time and then it's going to be like a good, a well-wrapped present, and then a immaculately wrapped present, <laughs> and then uh, just a video game wrapped normally on the inside. Oh, he's looking, he's fishing around, thinking that there's going to be something else in there. <laughs> he's like, the poncho, dude, this is even better. 
present number two. Keep going. Beautifully wrapped in Santa mm. paper. Again, I have my headphones, so I cannot hear your response. Right, fair. Wonderfully wrapped. Visual, visual. It's okay. It's not the best. Here, it has Santa Clauses of Just all keep different going. colors. Go, which go, is go, awesome. go, 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 keep go, wrapping. go, go. Okay. Go, go, go. Yes, so this one, uh, this one I also wrapped, but the twi- the other twist here is that these were all wrapped by different people. <laughs> so the, the outer one was me just doing the absolute worst job I could. <laughs> He's been so paranoid about this the whole time, I'm guessing. Oh, this is great. This is even better than I could have hoped for. This is the perfect vengeance. <laughs> I'm so happy this worked out the way it did. So another, yep, so he's got, I think he's found box number three now at this point. And have... <laughs> Another <laughs> box. Fun yet? And this yes. gift has a bow tied around it with white wrapping paper. <laughs> Gorgeous. <laughs> so I think he's on box number four. I think there's one more box. Wrapped box with an even prettier Beautiful. ribbon. It's a little thick blue and a uh, peppermint candy cane looking wrapping paper and a gorgeous gold bow. This is next level work. Three gorgeously wrapped presents, and I'm still going. <laughs> This is, this is the last one, I promise. Not retribution for a prank. And then in, inside... It's delightful. <laughs> it's delightful. He says it's delightful. Yeah. And then this last one is just the video game. I'm glad he has scissors, because this whole thing would have taken so much longer if he didn't. Present of the shape of a video game Yeah, put case. your headphones back on. PS4 put them back nature. on. Open it up. It's a game. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, it's a game. Wait, this could be the ultimate troll, though. This The, the glitter bomb could be in here. <laughs> like, this no, could it's be... No, it's not. I promise you, it's not a glitter bomb. <laughs> All right, we're your, here. Your friends, Ryan and Catherine, want you to know that they oh, wrapped. Oh, they helped you. They wrapped the beautiful ones, and I wrapped the, the, the second. I wrapped the out, outer box the worst possible way I could. He and should be I, here live then. And then I did a decent job, like as like a, a, a hearty effort on, on version number two. It takes two, baby. It takes yeah. two, baby. Make a Me dream come and you. true. Yes, it yes. takes two. You game got me year. game of the year. I got it. Before it was even game of the year, I got you. Look that. at you. And then it won game of Look the year, and I was like, you. Mirror, 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 on the inside. I couldn't say anything when we were watching that the game. That is Wars. incredible. Thank you, yes. Mr. Ryan and Catherine, for wrapping all those gorgeous presents because you did a wonderful job. I Way one. beyond. I one you said that was good. You said it was a well wrapped okay, gift, and that which, was what I Which wanted. one was yours? I wrapped the two on the outside, so I wrapped the the, the worst looking one and then the okay so looking okay. one. Gotcha. Yeah, the one with the Santa the green wrapping. the green Santa. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Awesome. Well, it's thank you. It worked out so much better than I could have hoped for because you were way over overly paranoid. I figured. Yeah, you yeah I was guess, terrified. I figured. I figured you would guess that it was Russian nesting dolls. That it was going to be like a presence within presence within presence. But I definitely didn't yeah. think you would guess that it was going to be more and more immaculately wrapped the further down you got. Oh, I def- that yeah, cool. that definitely. Yeah, that was yeah. awesome. All I right. loved it. So I got you. That was I delightful got you, and wonderful. Oh, uh, I'm glad you had the light out of it. Uh, I got you. It takes two because I it was a game of the year contender and I knew you wanted it and I knew it was mm-hmm. going to be co-op. Now, here's the thing. I plan on getting it a copy of my own for for myself, but I'm planning to play it with my wife. Me so too. I would recommend you do the same. Oh, perfect. Yeah, Great. I, awesome. yeah I want to. I was going to talk so, about that as soon as you were done. Bonnie experience yep. with your wife. Trophy, yep. easy, relatively easy trophy, I assume, and uh, game of the year experience. And that, yes. those are my reasons. Give me your reasons for near replicant, and then we'll go ahead and wrap this thing up. Uh, the reasons for near replicant are you've talked about it a lot. The, <laughs> the toss-up between that and what I wanted to get you otherwise... I guess it's part of the reason why I settled on that was I really want to get you Metroid, oh, yeah. but I knew we wanted to do the the charity. So I was trying to, I Not started price, the yeah. communication to get, to get you Metroid in some way help with help from other people, but that hasn't really came to fruition. So I, I tried to get you everything you wanted and more, but <laughs> yeah. I got you uh near replicant. Cause I knew that was like the top of your list other than Metroid. And right. it's a JRPG. You adored near automata so much that you I played did. it like one and a half times. I did. Uh, and you spoke about it at length on the podcast and our show. And I know as near replicant had been announced, you hadn't it had a chance to experience the original near and you wanted to, to get more of the lore. So there you go. Sweet. Thank you so much. That's I'm looking it. forward to it. And I'm happy with, I'm happy with, I would have been happy with Metroid, but I'm very happy with near replicant as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to I've got to figure out now when to play it. And don't Thanks. worry, I've got Metroid on my list, meaning that if I don't get it for Christmas, I fully intend on purchasing it 
however and for mm. however much I need to, right? So that will eventually happen. It's just I was waiting for the holidays. So so that's that then. Thank you for joining us live if you are live. But that is both favorite things in DLC. So <laughs> thank you for joining us for our gift exchange. And we got money to donate to causes in each other's names so have a great holidays everyone merry christmas and we hope that you have joy and time with family and all that good stuff this holiday happy holidays happy holidays all right that leads us to our main topic which i don't know why we're tackling this on christmas maybe because christmas is like the consumerist holiday or something but guys buckle up because we're going to talk about capitalism hitting the big one the big one so, all right, so we're talking about capitalism. I thought it was a fun, yeah, we were, we always try to think of like a Christmassy theme, like, oh, what can we talk about for Christmas this year? And I jokingly, I think at one point told you, I was like, let's do capitalism. <laughs> this is yeah. the most capitalist of holidays, at least in America. Let's do that. And I don't even think that's true. I think there are plenty of like other holidays that have been mired by the stench of capitalism. Uh, and Christmas also has a lot of other things about it. That's And we've done all of them. We've not all of them, but we've done a lot of them. So I figured, though, it would be fun to do capitalism. So, yeah. So let's jump into it then without dithering further. And, uh, yeah, so we're talking about capitalism. So we're going to start there. I mean, uh, I'm assuming most of our listeners are sophisticated enough intellectually to know what capitalism is. But I don't want to take that for granted. I don't know. I feel like it's pretty widespread at this point. But we're going to just go ahead and, like, define it anyways and talk about what it is. And that's going to be where we start. And we're going to say, what is capitalism? What are the advantages and problems of capitalism? And what are the alternatives to capitalism? Uh, as a quick disclaimer, we are not economic experts. So what follows, for the most part, is our observations and our opinions. And, you know, the research we've done as well. So uh, but, Neither uh, one of us have read Adam Smith's work, The Wealth of Nations. No. Okay, but it does come up if you look up capitalism. That sure. book is quoted often. Or we're like we don't, we're deep. not up to date with all of the biggest arguments and observances and and research on capitalism but we're gonna do our best to cover this uh and we're gonna do our best to be as i'm not gonna say that we're gonna be entirely neutral our biases are gonna show very clearly in a little bit but we you know we want to present capitalism kind of holistically but we're mostly we are mostly gonna be talking about how it affects video games hopefully and uh but we're gonna start with what it is right and we're gonna sort of lay that foundation to build off of for the rest of the episode so yeah why don't you hit us off termite what is the definition of capitalism The definition is an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than by the state. Right. Or rather than by the, well, it is by the people, but it's not like, it's not for the, you know, by the people for the people, it's by the people for profit. (laughs) I guess it's kind of the, um, I'm not quite sure I entirely agree. And like our government is not a for, or something. What's the, I did. Yeah. Well, no, Um, I just Googled it and that was like the Webster or whatever definition, but like our government is not making money our entire united states federal government is a non-profit like all of the mm-hmm. money that it makes it goes back into systems that pays for things right like i am i work a nine to five for a government contractor that government contractor gets government contracts that are funded by the government and that funding comes from like tax collection and stuff so like yeah. whatever the government makes it goes right back down to its people to pay the salaries of the people that work in the government to fund streets and roads and like at the local levels and so even our like county and our anyway that's capitalism like the right, government well, is not making money on its people yeah. it's distributing I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull a different definition here it's more or less the same pieces there just without any of the government like no, without talking about government at all and this is wikipedia's definition it just says capitalism is an economic system based on private ownership of the means of production and their operation for profit yeah, it makes so sense. taking government out of it, because oh, there's a lots of different ways that you could basically like run an economy. Capitalism is just the means by which it's, you know, where the means of production are owned by private individuals, not by groups or organizations necessarily. They are organizations, but they're owned by private people who have like invested in it. And then they operate that with the intention of generating profit. But the most important thing I want to highlight here, you know, again, when you're talking about the definition, it's also helpful sometimes to talk about what it's not and what capitalism is not is a government like it's not a government thing right like you could have Mm -hmm. capitalism operating in multiple different kinds of government Um, so you could have and we've seen that throughout history there are there are monarchies that were capitalist monarchies there could be 
dictatorships or authoritarian governments that are capitalist. In many ways, capitalism is intended, if you look at, what is it, Adam Smith? I don't know if it was Adam Smith who coined the term laissez-faire, but laissez-faire capitalism is supposed to actually operate in complete anarchy. Like it's not supposed to have any outside influence at all. You literally Mm. just let the market run. Yeah. So yeah, like, I mean, you can have capitalism in all kinds of different governments. So it has nothing to do with the government or the way that citizens are you know provided for protected or and and how those governmental officials are installed it's just literally just an economic system it stands in contrast to socialism in which the means of production are owned by the people and that could be the people through the government or it could just be the people as like a collective it's kind of called collectivism but the idea is that you know it's not for profit it's just so that all the needs and resources are distributed to the people and one more last note not to you know just because whenever you talk about capitalism you have to talk about its arch nemesis communism communism is socialism actually i learned that in my research i feel like that's a little factoid communism is just the state in which socialism is meant to bring about so like socialism at its per- in its most perfect form would be called a d- described as a communist state that makes sense hmm. Yep. So I didn't know that. Yeah, because people don't use those terms interchangeably and they're kind of meant to be used interchangeably, but they're not really the same. But they're a little different. Thing. Yeah. 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 So mm-hmm. cool. All right. One last thing about what it's not. Um, capitalism is not necessarily a more or less moral system than other forms of economics. The only like I like to say the only morality of capitalism is profit. Everything else, all the sort of moralities we apply to it. Where it's like, oh, it's it's so fair and it's so just. It's the only fair, just system, blah, 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 blah. No, it's not inherently any more fair than any other system because mm-hmm. the only goal of capitalism is profit for the private individuals who participate in it. Yep. So that can be a good thing. That can result in good things, but it's not any more or less moral. It doesn't have any kind of morality baked into it. Right. So that I just wanted to like be clear. It is what it is, right? It's very neutral. Mm-hmm. Apply morality to it. Um, and it requires external morality in order for it to be just. So mm-hmm. like runaway capitalism without morality can be a very dangerous thing, as we may or may not talk about. But yeah, hey. and then finally the kind of you want to talk Spoilers. about some of the basic ideas, like what, you know, you know, just from a basic level, we you know we talked about private ownership, but you want to talk about the two other kind of big ideas that kind of tie into the you know capitalist system there is the free market idea Mm -hmm. where like you said earlier every business production is on its own kind of autonomous to create its own profit Mm -hmm. Uh, and then of course supply and demand is like the backbone of it as supply Mm -hmm. goes down prices go up as demand goes up prices go up and vice versa they're kind of linked together if you have an overabundance of something and no demand the prices drop and that affects things like i mean i always when I first heard about like supply and demand, I'm thinking of like when I learned about it in school, pencils. I'm like, okay, the store doesn't have any pencils. They suddenly get one in and it's the most expensive pencil because there's only one. Or they have an entire shelf of pencils and nobody wants them. So they're like 25 cents a piece. Right, uh, but right. actually, it affects things like oil and yeah. real estate, which drive our economy in- insanely uh, for oh, all yeah. of business expenses and living expenses. So supply and demand can really, really affect uh everyone oh yeah and labor level. labor is affected by the laws of supply and demand too right exactly. if there's a yep. lot of people all going for the same job then the quote price of that job what what the the employer has to pay that goes down when mm-hmm. there's what we're seeing now with the great resignation when there's not anybody gunning for that job and there's so many open spots and there you know the demand is up on the employer side then the the cost of that employee goes up so all these ideas kind of tie together into this idea that like the only thing that dictates the prices is, is supply and demand in a free market unimpeded by external forces and you know again that stands in contrast to the idea of like the government setting the prices right so the king just arbitrarily determining well you know Grain is now going to cost this much because I am the monarch and I'm in charge of the economy. (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Mm -hmm. Anyways, cool. So let's talk about some of the advantages really quick. In a perfect world, (laughs) in a world full of moral people, of just people, in a world where, you know, we don't have greed and all that stuff. Like what what and, and, and most importantly, in the world that we've seen with capitalism before, right? Like capitalism isn't always you know isn't an inherent like i said it's not an inherently bad system it could be exploited just like any system but like it's done good things for the world and what are some of those good things what are the advantages what has capitalism sort of given to society global society i i have to do like my little 
silent eye roll when I say this because <laughs> yeah. I have to like concede some of my. Of course, it's mis- an exercise yeah, in humility. It's, it's, it's an sure, exercise in critical but, thinking. <laughs> <laughs> wealth generation and the boost of the middle class, quote unquote. The government does not own any means of production. Private citizens generate and control the wealth. So ideally, it's distributed to the masses based on the value of labor, goods, and services as determined by supply and demand. So like when people come out and they say, you know, the poorest people in the United States are actually extraordinarily wealthy compared to third world countries. There's some truth to that, but I still like a lot of people use that argument to blow over a lot of problems, but we're not doing that right now. So we're just looking at the advantages of what capitalism has done. And there is like a certain value of it it would not exist if it were not for government interference. But like there is systems in place that you can get supplemental income from the government or you have a job that doesn't pay you enough or maybe you can make ends meet, get some roommates and make like an apartment work somewhere and you're living in a roof like you have a house that's stable. It has electricity and water. Right. I was gonna think about like you got to think about wealth as something more than just literal money. Right. You have to think about wealth in terms of technology uh, in terms of life expectancy, in terms of population. Wealth is more than just literal money and who has it and who doesn't. Right. Wealth is, when you think about it, you know, think about it not just in terms of like, oh, America is more, you know, the poorest people in America are more rich than the poorest people in a third world country today. Think of wealth generation in terms of 200 years ago, the richest person did not live as comfortably as even poor people today, right? Because we have air condition, you know, everyone has air condition, but most people have roofs over their heads. Most people mm-hmm. have the ability to, they don't have to go hunt for their own food and stuff, right? Like conveniences. Yes, we have conveniences. We have warm water mostly. Yep. Many of them have been driven by cap by uh, capitalism. Some of the other things, you know, again, in a perfect world, it results in less government interference. You know, there's sort of this kind of, the reason why democracy and capitalism are tied together sometimes is because or often is because again when it's working the way it's supposed to it is sort of democratic right we the consumers vote essentially with our wallets as to what products are going to be successful what businesses are valuable and so there's sort of you know the you know, having the government not control that and again if you compare it to the past you know there were monarchies who they would just like arbitrarily decide that like nope you whatever you have i'm taking it and you're gone either work the farms or face exile right like mm-hmm. they could just arbitrarily determine that because they were in charge of all that stuff because they had all the guns right and they had all the swords mm-hmm. so you know in a capitalist system, that's not supposed to happen. Whether it does or not is neither here nor there. But yeah, all this stuff is driven by the next thing. Competition and innovation with caveats. Ideally, <laughs> producers are motivated to make the best possible product or risk loss of revenue. Competition keeps this in check. If one company gets out of hand, a competitor could undercut them or make a better product. It's a good example I like here is like Burger King versus McDonald's. Mm-hmm. They both make kind of the same level of fast food stuff and you're going to make a decision which one you like better and there's going to be different promotions at each place to try to increase the price to value ratio or like price to product you know whatever and then like taco bell comes out and there's oh we're gonna think outside the bun ha (laughs) see how's that for capitalism and like innovate entirely and do tacos and stuff but you gotta yeah the clever quips and puns are are also one of the best byproducts of capitalism yeah that's why i said exactly (laughs) slogans (laughs) Yeah, and then that goes all the way up to like government contractors trying to like bid for contracts and like creating all this crazy technology that gets us into space and aeronautics and uh, aerospace engineering and like solar power and gas electric or you know gas versus electric cars and like all of that stuff is all a competition and innovation that's happening that's really cool and really fascinating. It's actually like if I have to say there's any one thing about capitalism that I do enjoy, quote unquote, it's the fact that. If someone else is doing something better than you, it causes you to think better and think smarter and well, yeah, come up with something. There's different that... ways to compete. You can lower if you are yep. capable of finding a way to lower prices or make something more efficiently to lower prices. You can do it that way. You can compete yep. by being more convenient. That's the fast food model, mm-hmm. right? Like you think in competition when it comes to food, it'd be like, oh, who can make the best food with the most quality ingredients? And that's how you compete. And obviously, some restaurants do compete in that way. But fast food came along and was like, no, we're just going to make it as easy as possible, right? Like as easy and convenient as possible. And that's how they compete. So, like, again, that's what I mean by competition and innovation. They drive each other. And mm-hmm. ideally, you get you ultimately end up getting more variety, more types of products, more and, and ultimately more quality or more of some kind of need that you didn't know you had. Ideally, that's what capitalism drives. And that's why I said with caveats is 
ideally it works that way because everybody can think of examples of things like price fixing or or monopolies or you know driving the competition out of business or Mm anti-competitive behavior and all that stuff happens in capitalism too but the idea what's how it's supposed to operate is it's supposed to be like that's not that stuff's not supposed to happen because consumers are supposed to be able to say no no that sucks i'm going to your competition instead that doesn't Mm -hmm. always happen for reasons we'll get into i mean therefore that's why we ultimately end up with my next point here of check checks and balances a balance of power is supposed to exist between consumers investors and the people who produce things i call them producers and that's sort of a general catch-all term for companies that either make things or provide things there's Mm -hmm. supposed to be a balance of power those things are supposed to all kind of keep each other in check the consumers are supposed to you know vote with their wallets for the best products or the best services Um, the investors are in turn supposed to see how the consumers are reacting to things and decide to you know invest in businesses that are providing you know the the best possible things and then producers are supposed to be driven by that supply and demand to to do the best like the right thing right for consumers so that's what's supposed to happen um, and that's why again people often consider it very compatible with with democracy but uh, and then finally the last one i'll just hit real quick again in a perfect world it results in more upward mobility by that we mean that anybody can more or less change their station there's no formal class system there's a formal class system i should say forcing yeah. people into poverty um, we will talk about some class classist behavior uh, of capitalism but it's not like formalized it's not like nobody can genuinely to your face directly and out in public in the open stop you from like getting a better job or getting an education and eh. making a livelihood for yourself i know i know i know <laughs> i know I'm saying it's not supposed to happen that way. Like yeah. anybody's supposed to be able to just get out there and make it happen. And it's human nature to exploit that. But capitalism, you know, is designed. And when people defend it, they talk about this a lot. But it doesn't always happen that way. So cool. Well, that leads us right into it. Why doesn't it's it always happen great, that way? <laughs> Why doesn't great it always segue happen that way? Right into the problems with capitalism. And this is the stuff that I had mostly kind of brought to this conversation. But... <laughs> Well, uh, I had to bring about, the others, right? <laughs> you did, yeah. you did such a good job <laughs> providing the problems. <laughs> so what you had just said about how, like, you know, there's no formal class system forcing people into poverty. There's no government saying these, well, yeah, there is. Okay. Um, unequal opportunities. No, no, there's not. They're not, they're not doing it on the surface. <laughs> Have you heard what about I mean? redlining about, and like, gerrymandering? Because that's kind of what that is. No, but it is. That's a different but, conversation. But it's what it's not. I want to talk about what it's not. What it's not is the caste system of India, yeah, yeah, where true. it was right. like, no, these people are the priests, and they have this advantage. Mm-hmm. Not only do they have this advantage because they were born this way, but we will literally kill you if you try to you know, make yourself equal to them. That's not yeah. going to happen in capitalism, but you're right. There are governmental things that enforce a class system carry on though i want yeah, you to yeah that's fine it. so uh the problems with, ca- with capitalism unequal opportunities while the united states has made great strides in removing legal barriers to equal opportunity at least half the difference in income between any two people is determined by their parents either through their inherited traits like intelligence good looks ambition and reliability like their nature or through the quality and circumstances of their upbringing and education their nurture so that's a huge issue with capitalism again with the the government redlining districts and like wealth distribution and how people come out of different communities. There's actually a calculator that exists on the web. I'll let y'all, the audience, Google this, but you can accurately predict someone's salary based on zip code and some other like questions about your your age, race, and your ethnicity. And that's more reliable than like trying to figure out like what your degree path might be and it's just because it's so powerful from where you came from and who your parents are and like generational wealth which i guess i will get to in the next couple of bullet points here well really quick really quick i want to yeah and when i think of unequal opportunities what sort of turned my mind around on this issue is when someone described to me how expensive it is to be poor and you think what expensive to be poor Mm -hmm. well it's like you ask you go through the quest checklist right like okay well why don't they just get a job Okay. All right. Let's talk about a job. All right. Let's say they let's say they manage to get a job. They get a job making minimum wage, which is a whole different is, issue. But yep. so Terrible. what they're making? What is it? Yep. Is it what is it now? Is it seven fifty? It's not even, or something. It's not even fifteen. So seven fifty an hour. Okay. So you make think, what? Like a couple hundred bucks a week, right? Okay. Well, uh, you know, how do you get to this job? Okay. Well, why don't they just walk? 
Okay, well, you know, they live in uh, even just a normal city in America is like, okay, well, the prices of apartments near their house are going to be exorbitant because that's where all the people want to live. They're in high demand. So they have to live further away. Uh, so they either have to take, you know, public transportation if they're lucky, which costs money, or they mm -hmm. have to take, they have to live in the suburbs or whatever and drive, mm -hmm. or they have to live outside farther away and from the middle of the city. And they can't afford a reliable car. So right. the car itself is a money pit. It's that's a money pit, suck. right? Yeah. yeah. Think about how much mm -hmm. you have to, have to repair it. You can't keep up yep. with repairs and maintenance on it because that's expensive. That costs too much money mm -hmm. on a hundred, yep. couple hundred bucks a month. And you can't, you have to repair it constantly. And then th even things like shoes, right? It's like you, it's like you want to buy a nice quality pair of shoes that'll last you a while. You can't. Well, if you're poor, you maybe have 20 bucks, a, you know, a, a quarter to, to budget towards shoes. So you got to buy the crappiest versions from Walmart and they're going to wear out after, you know, by the end of the month. And so you have to buy them mm -hmm. again and again and again. So whereas a good pair of shoes might last you a couple of years. They can't ever afford that barrier of entry. And it's just there's right. so many examples of this. You know, mm -hmm. And then the counter argument is, why don't you get a better job? And you're like, well, you need education. So why don't you go to college? <laughs> Have you seen the prices yeah. of education? Oh, don't get so, me started like, on the whole like, oh, I went to school for just working a part time job in the summer. It's like, <laughs> have you seen the cost? And have you seen, right. remember, you guys haven't raised that minimum wage that that person is making now. So yeah, sure. You clearly did not benefit from your college education that you paid for with a part time job because you clearly don't understand how inflation works. <laughs> and this is, again, like, perfect for highlighting the problems of a capitalistic society because like social like social benefits of the government or should be controlled by the government are not so things like education and healthcare are capitalist so like you go see a doctor and that doctor yeah, charges for you profit. services for profit and they're making a profit and so they have to and they're lobbying or, or being like manipulated by the pharmaceutical companies insurance, to like shell out drugs and like yeah. so uh, incentivized i should say not manipulated they're incentivized mm -hmm. to like do extra procedures well, and extra they gotta tests pay for their because super they gotta pay for the equipment education and their education like so many yes. doctor procedures don't cost nearly as much in you know in the sheer amount of like uh materials mm -hmm. right what you're looking at doctors raise these prices so high because they're like i gotta pay these i gotta pay off my student loans <laughs> right <laughs> and like then they ridiculous. start a practice and that practice requires equipment so extremely uh -huh. expensive extremely expensive bespoke equipment for specific tests gotta play scans, employees. and operations yep. and you gotta pay the employees and you have to pay like the facilities and all of these yeah but anyway so like unequal opportunities that's that generally with capitalism the entire system is one's gain is another's loss. Sure. It's it's perfectly articulated in the show Squid Game. So if you want to know what I'm talking about, just go watch that. It's a giant, what do you call it, metaphor or analogy mm -hmm. on the capitalist system consuming one another so much that you lose relationships. And that's what capitalism is on a right. grander scale. The nature scale, of competition is you are trying to are trying to be the best. Yep. So that means someone else, so you're trying to get the money, you know, two pizza places, they got to compete. They don't both get to exist, right? <laughs> or the, you right. Know, unless there's enough demand, but you know, if there's not enough demand, then they both have to try to outdo one another, which means one of mm -hmm. them is always at the risk of losing something. May not, maybe not going out of business, but losing something. Uh, yeah. It is kind of dog eat dog by its very nature. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, I mean, they're two skilled pizza makers, potentially equally skilled pizza makers. And one of them could go away forever. Because because the other one did better. And is that fair? I don't know. Maybe yeah. it is, but it shouldn't be. Like, shouldn't we ha couldn't we have two pizza people working together to make the best possible pizza for everyone as long as they were taken care of and didn't have to, you know, compete to survive? Yeah, whatever. We'll get into all that. Yep. Inequality so, is another problem. Yeah, inequality, yeah. Yep, this is like the running away effect or like the snowball effect where you have a massive company. Think of like Rockefeller and oil, like yeah. in his inheritance down to the extreme like dynasty that is his entire pedigree of people that exist today rockefeller center in new york city sure, like that yeah. is just wealth gaining wealth gaining wealth gaining wealth across generations so and when it's people not talk even about like privilege this is what they're talking about they're saying yep. that like someone who someone whose parents were rich can afford to go to the best school get the best education they don't have to mm -hmm. think about things like paying their cell phone bill on time because mommy and daddy take care of that they don't have to think yep. about things like cars and shoes that we were just talking about because they can afford the best their, their parents can afford the best of the best mm -hmm. they don't ever have to stress and worry so their health is better they can afford the best doctors and health care they look you know they, so they end up looking better they end up feeling better they end up having energy and health and time and everything to just do whatever they want and apply themselves and 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 someone else who has to worry about those things doesn't you know, and it snowballs it balloons it exactly. increases like exponentially across generations and it's impossible to stop and now right. you have jeffrey bezos and so for <laughs> all the the capitalist or all that capitalism has given us the middle class in particular um the middle class you see is disappearing because they're able to because of their power and because of their wealth 
the richest of the rich get to consolidate their power and consolidate their wealth and that's stripping it basically from the middle class as well as the lower class pretty pretty insane yep. other things you know consumerism which results in environmental destruction if you think about it i was recently introduced to this idea through the current the current inflation issue we're facing almost all the inflation inflation is basically just like supply or demand gets out of control and the prices get so high that it begins to result in anarchic behavior right like if you if the prices are just too high for anything then people are going to start fighting and stealing and killing and it's just, it, and it's going to be beyond what the government's capable of cracking down on so you really need to avoid they call it hyperinflation mm -hmm. there's two kinds of hyperinflation there's demand it's called demand shock inflation and supply shock inflation and almost all of the things that we have to stop inflation are demand shock related um, we've never faced a supply shock inflation before because we've always been able to make more supply or get more supply right. or consume more and mm -hmm. more and more. The problem is we're running out. We, for the first time in in capitalism history, are reaching the critical mass of what we're capable of producing. The example I saw was sugarcane. The The world consumes just an obscene amount of sugar in any given year, and mm -hmm. the sugar cane is, because of climate change, sugar cane is disappearing and climate change has been mostly driven by large corporations who are trying to meet the demand that we consumers have put on it. So consumerism at, at, at its core is basically just like the consumers are indoctrinated to consume more and more and more and more and more. They are discouraged from saving or investing, um, even frowned upon, and it's all to prevent people from well, un, amassing wealth to challenge those who are in control. Um, and consumerism leads to eventually because we're just told to consume, 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 create more and more and more and more and more and more demand. It actually ends up having an effect on the environment. Right. And that's why we saw mm -hmm. climate change, because they just keep doing more to meet that demand. And they have quotas and they've got, you know, uh, shareholders to please. So they'll do whatever they need to. And to exacerbate that, like anything used to save or to quell the environment costs yep. money and or that requires work and time yep. to like generate and that's expensive and it costs and it takes away their profits so yeah they want to scale production high to sell more stuff but saving the environment costs more it's lack of optimization optimization sometimes so they can't produce as much and new technology alternatives are just astronomically expensive to research and implement and change your entire system to do so they're not incentivized whatsoever to change their tactics or their production lines to favor the environment therefore it it's it feels like it's all like critical mass. It's just it is. like it is. Yeah. And that's why we're reaching these levels of hyperinflation. And that's why we're reaching. <clears throat> we are reaching this point where we've we've stripped the earth of what it's able to provide for us. This was almost inevitable, right? Like if nothing had changed, this was inevitable. This was the end. Mm -hmm. This was the end point. Now, I wouldn't even say end goal. This was just, you know, if, <laughs> if someone was writing a book about this, about a humanity, just the story of humanity, everyone would be like, oh, well, that's a red herring or not red herring. That's a Chekhov's gun. Everybody knows that's event. That gun's eventually yep. going to go off. They're going to run out of stuff. And and that is uh, it's not maybe not there yet, but like it's just going to slowly happen over time uh, again as things get out of control, unless we do something about it. But mm -hmm. the thing is, again, things are slow to happen. You you may be wondering at this point, if we've gone through all these problems, well, how is all of this stuff like legal? Like, right. Like, well, how can we let all this stuff happen in capitalism? Like, shouldn't once again, shouldn't supply and demand basically like stop this? Shouldn't consumers be able to stop this kind of stuff by just, you know, again, you know, if if. If the rich are getting too rich, why don't we stop buying from them? Blah, blah, blah. You may have, you know, you may be wondering how could we have let it get to this point? How can they get away with some of these things? Well, that that's a, kind of the last point there is, uh, again, because there is, number one, because there is no in, internal morality to capitalism, you have to inflict morality upon it. And we've actually seen this in the past in, in the form of things like trust busting, right? Teddy Roosevelt breaking up those monopolies because there's nothing inherently to stop a monopoly from forming in capitalism. In fact, one happened. should argue it should be the goal of any capitalist business is to create a monopoly so that you control the supply and demand. But we don't like that as society. So we said a very almost socialist thing to say, no, 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 you can't. We need more competition. So we're going to actually interfere in this case with capitalist systems occurring. But the thing is, though, like we're swinging a little too far in the other direction now because, you know, we, we have this thing called lobby being. Basically, corporations are able to lobby the government to make changes and laws that benefit them, allow them to solidify power, create monopolies, and involve themselves with the governance over the people, right? Because cap in a capitalist system, the government's not supposed to, supposed to interfere with capitalism, but ca there's nothing to stop capitalism from interfering with the government through either direct mm -hmm. bribery or through systems like lobbying, where they basically mm -hmm. get to just, like, they basically get to govern you, right? Like, corporations are governing you more than you think they are because they lobby so much and 
corporations aren't full of elected officials. So <laughs> it becomes... Exactly. Yeah, so uh, if left unchecked, this kind of thing could result in the government becoming sort of a sham and just a tool for what would then be called a corporate oligarchy. Um, remember, that's not too long ago that corporations had the much, much more restrictions on them. In fact, it was less business savvy to start a corporation than uh, like things like cooperatives or just you know running small business uh, because corporations had so many rules attached to them. Mm-hmm. Well, over time, they've chipped away at those rules and they've they've whittled away and made it once again so corporations can be as powerful as they are. And they still have some checks on them, but those again, once again, they're just continuing to fight. That's the thing is if we don't fight against it, then they will continue to fight for themselves to solidify their power. Um, mm-hmm. and that's what lobbying and that's what corporate power is, is um, their ability to do that because corporations have so many privileges. Whew, anything else? Any other final thoughts with the problems? Yeah, the, There's so much, the obviously. Intent, but... There is. The intent of lobbying would be to like people in Congress, for example, knew nothing about video games when yeah. like Mortal Kombat was happening and the ESA stood up the rating system. Like that was actually a positive sure, outcome yeah. for like keeping the government sort of in check when it came to governing video games. And so the entire video game industry can now flourish, you know, at the time thrive because they didn't have the government oversight and the, uh, the whole ESRB rating came about from that. And that's like a positive thing for lobbying. So that's the one counter argument for what lobbying is. It sounded really terrible as you were explaining it. It was like, well, it it has a good intention. It's supposed to kind of allow the government to not overreach. Right. Yeah. Everybody is supposed to be able to lobby the government. That's sort of the foundation is the idea that everyone's supposed to be able to go and talk about what is in their best interests. Yep. The problem is, you know, if you're working nine to five job and all you have time is over the weekends. Oh, guess what? Congress doesn't meet over the weekends. So, you know, like yeah. the average person, you know, their means of lobbying has to be like, call your senator. Um, yep. But like corporations can literally hire people whose entire job is to do that. But but yeah, I mean, there have been there have absolutely been things that have been lobbied for well. But I would say that most of the time people associate lobbying with like the cigarette industry in like 50s being able to put on their packaging how good cigarettes were for children, how it'll help their Mm -hmm. breathing and their development (laughs) because they were able to lobby the government to get them to allow that. And then it took a lot of like concentrated lobbying from nonprofit organizations and health officials to like get that removed. And in fact, the opposite right now, you have to Mm -hmm. like talk about how harmful it is. So it's just, yeah, there's so many, I just it, it, the whole system has just become control, and that's why that's why I keep bringing up this idea of morality. Like we need to apply external morality to capitalism in order to restrain it, because unrestrained, it can be just as bad, if not worse, than any other system. All right, let's talk about which came for video games. Yeah, video games. You're here for video At games. Christmas let's talk time. About it. It's Christmas. Talk, let's talk about video games. What is the video games industry's relationship to capitalism? How has the system shaped the gaming industry and what kinds of harms and benefits has it brought? I'm going to start real quick only because I want to say real quick, games exist because of capitalism. Or I should say rather, we only have video games due to capitalism and the overall value that entertainment is given in our capitalist society, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that entertainment isn't valuable to other economic systems, but like entertainment as we know it flourished because of capitalism, right? Because of really the law of supply and demand, at least in its in its infancy, is, you know, people just had such a demand for this that they this kind of stuff that they wanted more, right? And that's kind of how it started with video games too. So like maybe there's an alternate universe where capital or where a non-capitalist system developed video games, but you know, the te- technology and everything that was foundational to video games, you know, it, it all kind of emerged at the sort of peak of capitalism. Mm-hmm. And so I would just simply, I'll just, yeah, I'll just say that like we, we have games because of video or because of capitalism. Yep. We have video games may not have gotten the traction and it may not have reached the heights that it has reached were it not for supply and demand that we have. Mm-hmm. So, cool. Yeah. I mean, as we were talking about like generational wealth kind of snowballing and the scale getting bigger and bigger and bigger for people's wealth, the same thing has kind of happened with video games. Like they've evolved now. It's the whole reason we started our podcast into a yeah. major storytelling art form. And we want to like educate and talk about and be involved in the gaming industry in a fun and meaningful way because video games have evolved into this zeitgeist of amazingness. And so what used to just be an Atari sitting in someone's basement with two ping pong paddles and a ball like Pong, that was a fun little thing to do one night. It's now like I'm going to sink 80 hours into this massive story and I'm going to be a changed individual. I'm going to cry and it's I'm going to be weeping and like you get so much more affected out of it. And that's the growth of video games. And some of that like. With that growth, the budgets have also increased 
And yep. so games are enormously expensive to to make. The hardware that they run on is way more powerful than they've ever been before. Uh, and to generate these types of things, like it just took, you know, it's, was it, is it Moore's Law that says like processors have two times as many transistors every year, <laughs> year yeah. or whatever. Well, yeah, right. and, so, because, and it's because of everything we were talking about before, where it's like competition and innovation, right? Like mm-hmm. consume, the power of consumers to, to shape and determine what they want. And we've seen some sort of dystopian aspects of that too, right? Where like video games, we talk about all the time, video games were primarily marketed towards like teenage boys when they could have much sooner been marketed to a wider audience had they been perceived as such. But no, it was little boys who were making it and little boys who were buying it, right? So like, yeah. and, but but the idea is still like, again, they, but they still just sort of compete with one another. And that was driving innovation constantly. We talked about, we gave, broke that down a lot in our um, exclusivity episode. All that mm-hmm. is like, again, capitalism 101, right? And and yeah, the amount, I mean, talk, again, talk about wealth generation. The video game industry is a pretty great example, right? This all started as dudes who had like nothing. And now it's a massive, massive billion dollar industry it was a billion dollar industry that sprung up over the course of like 30 years that's pretty pretty impressive (laughs) also ruled by dudes who now have everything and that's a problem because women don't and other races don't and there's a lack of diversity and it's a problem it's getting better but it's it's a problem but it is that's a whole different i mean that's capitalism too sure but it it doesn't change the fact that like games there was no wealth in games and now there's tons of wealth in games so wealth happened yep yeah (laughs) yes it did yeah. yeah all of the the cost it takes to make a game, you know, is fed by corporate funds. So big corporations, publishers come up, they fund the money. Every decision about how a game is made, it's it's driven by money. You you need to increase your profit year over year. You need to please your share and stakeholders. This aspect stifles creativity as more creative solutions usually increase risk increased risk reduces desire for investment and this is why we have annualized call of duty and assassin's creed franchises and i used those two specifically because one is kind of a multiplayer focused grindy shooter and the other one is an open world exploration game they rehash over and over again yeah the same formula because it works it has made money in the past it is not risky we know people like it let's keep making it let's keep going right and nintendo has fallen into this too with mario and Mm -hmm. zelda and while they do innovate between each release there's still a basic formula basic thread and a reduction in risk knowing like this is what link looks like this is what mario is this is what pokemon is i mean pokemon really suffers from the rinse and repeat like constant annualized sort of formula that they've done and that's all because of capitalism so that's Absolutely. like gaming's yep. relationship it totally to has shifted and, and you know we kind of very abruptly pivoted in sort of some of the more harmful ways and i'm fine with that like because yeah we talked about how it's like yeah it drives up innovation and it drives up no, like, we're coming back we'll get positive but in a minute it also just you know you know so we'll give you a whiplash we'll go positive negative yeah. positive negative <laughs> yeah but yeah in that vein it's like yes as much as they've <laughs> innovated they've also sort of like landed on things formulas that have worked and then like that's where the money goes because it's made money. And eventually, you know, it, it kind of backfires. Eventually it becomes where it's just like, but then, you, but by then you've probably have people hooked, right? Cause the nature of these things is they're also designed to be somewhat addictive. Even the, even the best games still have addictive like design mm-hmm. choices. And that has been a problem that capitalism has fueled too, because of course, I mean, of course capitalism wants to create addicts because you're not, then you're not a thinking participating consumer who's exercising their power. No, instead you're addicted, right? Like, because you can't stop yourself from doing it because there's something in your brain that is compelling you, compulsing you to do it. And you are not happy without it and you're not happy with it, but you're not happy without it either. So it's like, I mean, addicts, uh, addiction is a crazy, awful thing we've talked about on the podcast before. And capitalism's happy to create addicts. That's why we have the mobile thing. So it's all, again, it's all tied together into this idea that like, because profits, what matters, the money's going to go towards what has been proven to work before. And eventually that results in less innovation, less creativity and less risk every time. Mm -hmm. Go on. Next one. Yep. So the rebuttal, the rebuttal for that is we look at the Activisions and the EAs of the Ubisofts of the world, the big giant publishers, the little man, the little woman, there is the indie movement. That's an upward this mobility. Where, <laughs> yes, it's where creativity flourishes. Games get made because platforms are now more approachable than ever. Platforms adopting the x86 architecture and cross-compiling between ARM, which is what Switch runs on, and the x86, which is PC and all the other major consoles. There's a super low barrier of entry. The technology, the engines like Unity, and I know Unreal has a licensing issue. like You have to pay for that. But like the engines have gotten better, reusable, more modular from a development perspective that allow creative people to get in through to get over that technological barrier of entry making software and just go straight to game making so we're seeing now like a flood especially with like game pass and ea has a a wing id at xbox has its own funding wing so the publishers are actually taking risks on the side of course very safe very safe risks 
and like letting creativity flourish. And we're seeing really cool games. One is like everybody's gone to the rapture and in games like that, I can't, there's a million of them that I'm, escapes me now, but what was Hazel light studios? Most recent one, the it two player, two. it takes two. Yeah. That's another example of one that's actually doing really well. And it was nominated for game of the year. So it, that shows you indie studio funded by EA initially, but like, that's one example. Um, that's Did you hear they got a, their, a uh... relationship with capitalism. The gaming industry is shaped by, so capitalism allows for, corporations to run wild and not take risks it stifles creativity so there was a response a natural response how can we get the creativity out there how can we get smaller p- folks to make good games and get their name out there and make them money too and like get cool stuff out there and they, and we found a way and so like that's happening in, in the industry now and that's yeah. really cool to see it is my rebuttal to your rebuttal the downside yeah. of that how that's kind of gone wrong are a couple of the points i have further down on the notes which are curation uh yeah right curation well not just curation but also just the idea well there's a reason for curation right the reason for curation is because again once again attention is currency in in this stage of capitalism right or in this stage of the technology of capitalism and that is that like sure yeah the indie movement proved that the little guy can put it together and make it happen but it's the same kind of problem that like hollywood faces with talent which is that like oh okay well now that every now that some people have made it successful well they're all getting snatched up by the big developers now mm-hmm. <laughs> and consolidation's yep. happening which is a whole nother thing so competition consolidation's happening so yeah hazel lights now owned by ea so as great and indie as they once were they're not anymore and there's no way it takes two is considered an in, should be considered an indie game they are being funded by ea they're at the very least a double a game So things like that. But in order to get noticed, in order to get successful, you have to draw attention to your game. That doesn't always mean that it's a good game, right? Uh, It means that you've either paid for or hired or are just naturally good at just advertising and social media and all that stuff to get attention on your game um, so that it does get curated and so that it does float to the top because the truth is there's a sea now of indie games out there. There's a sea of indie developers. What once started as a small movement of people just like, doing their best to make good games independently now it's a whole ocean and now the triple a gaming scene has totally embraced quote unquote embrace the indie movement but they're not embracing it for what it's supposed to be they're poaching it for talent (laughs) in order to sell more games of theirs so it is again that's all that's all totally valid quote unquote in capitalism uh, as much as it may frustrate people, it is totally valid. Mm-hmm. But you're right; it's still it's still possible out there. The platforms exist. The means to you know the opportunities, quote unquote, still exist. It's just now the supply is a lot higher, so the demand is uh, is much more tricky to to generate for your game. Mm-hmm. And then without that demand, you're not going to sell any copies, and you're just going to be another dude in his basement trying to make a game, trying to get his ar- artistic vision out there, and failing. And that sucks. That sucks because you should. You should. If you if you can make a video game, then you deserve to make it and to deserve people to see it. Uh, but that's not that's not the way the system is. So, mm. but you're right. There's like so much stuff. Like, have you seen the Steam and eShop store? Yeah. Like, and the place there's th- like I don't. There's a thousand. There's yeah, it's thousands of games there released every year. Absolutely, every year. It's mm-hmm. just constant. Like every week, there's a drop of ten to fifteen titles, and they're all stuff you'd never heard of. You don't know what they are. Most of them are just cash grab trash titles that flood the store and so if you are an independent developer and you do make something great it's very difficult for your name to get to the top that's yeah, the curation I mourn, issue i mourn for all the hidden gems out there i mourn mm-hmm. for all because because you know i didn't always love the i didn't always want to part i like the indie movement but i never wanted to participate in it at first but then i've played some great indie games in the last few years and you know the most recent one hades notwithstanding it was amazing so and hollow knight too actually i think is indie uh, and both of them are fantastic games and they float to the top because uh, they do float to the top because they're good games, but they also have developers who know how to and teams, you know, they're big enough to have teams of people to actually market them as well. So, mm-hmm. yeah, anyways, moving on. I think that another big problem, another effect definitely that capitalism has had is the monetization. Yes, discussion the in the room. <laughs> The biggest you know, problem. We, so whether it's microtransactions or free to play or, or or even just things like subscription models and oh gosh, uh, loot box, all of it, just different monetization strategies. The problem at first, it was just like, we want to make a good game so that it sells. Mo- so it sells copies and makes us money. Now it's how can we make the game make generate money, right? Like it's it, it used to be like, let's make a good game and that will make money. Now it's let's make a game that is specifically designed to make money. And so it affects game design, right? And we have talked in this podcast at length of all the different examples. Battlefront, 
most recently Halo Infinite. Like, yeah, actually, yep, you know, that's in bridled in. All of them yep. are just like they're just engines now to, and that's not talking about the mobile market and all of the you know freemium predatory. Just oh, it's everywhere, and it's become it's shaped. It's become it's become what the gaming industry is more than the games itself. I think in many ways, and that sucks. And that's all been fueled by capitalism gone. Amok. Any of the last points? Let's wrap it up a little bit and talk about our last question before we go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. Go ahead. So yeah, I think those are kind of some of the major ways. I mean, it, it, in all of this stuff, I mean, we've talked about a lot about capitalism, and we are just like really hitting things hard and fast because there's and the things that stand out to us the most because there's so much i mean capitalism is a huge discussion we could there are there are entire podcasts dedicated to capitalism Mm -hmm. and you could dedicate an entire podcast dedicated to capitalism and its intricacies in the gaming industry so we're trying to hit high level as hard and fast as we can yep but it's just it is so much so the last question i had i feel like is, is is a fair question and you know we can hopefully do it in like five minutes but let's put on our speculative hats then let's put on our imagination and talk about how do you think the video game industry would look in a different economic system so we talked about how like we have in many ways capitalism to thank for video games but does that mean that it only works in capitalism does that mean that the video game industry and the video games as an artistic endeavor and as a form of entertainment and as a form of joy and value in people's lives does it need capitalism to work is i guess the question to this and then if it doesn't, what do you imagine the perfect solution to video ga- the video game industry would be if not under capitalism? What do you think the solutions are? Uh, how do we mitigate these problems, whether it be through a new system or how do we adjust capitalism to suit you know the best possible direction well, for the video game industry? I guess adjusting capitalism is a little much, but you can at least create a space for you to exist and flourish. And one of the biggest concessions of termites specifically from previous episodes is looking at unionization in the gaming industry. We know now that because Blizzard and Activision has been in the headlines because of the California lawsuit for a horrible work environment, exploitation of workers, uh, wage gaps between gender and all of those things that are happening. So like unionization, that's where like, how could the video game industry look different in another economic system? Well, and not in another economic, in this economic system, it could look better if there was unionization in video games that looks like the Hollywood Screen Actors Guild uh, and other creative endeavors with musicians and such, where you do have an organization that is protected by the government that has backing to stifle some of this horrible, like microtransaction gambling issues, as well as the terrible companies treating their employees like garbage yeah. and, and don't consuming, forget, exploiting them started as like unions started as a, I mean, as a, as a grassroots labor movement, right? Like the mm-hmm. idea being that like laborers can take control and unions are the formal way of doing it. But the general idea of labor is just being like, no, we don't have to participate. <laughs> yep. Like you need us just as much as we need you. Right. You can't make the thing shareholders you can't make the thing board of directors you can't make the thing upper management ceos c-level employees you can't do the thing you organize the labor and that's the only value you bring the Mm -hmm. developers make the games and if they all Mm -hmm. decide to not participate then the profits start tanking and that goes in every industry so i'm pro union for that reason because at the ultimate at the end of the day you can strike too yeah you can strike yeah labor you know the whole point of Again, we talked about the checks and balances between consumers, investors, and laborers. And if consumers aren't going to do their job of acting ethically and morally and voting voting with their wallet by supporting companies that not only make good products, but also are ethical and moral themselves, treating their employees well and all that stuff. If the consumers aren't going to do it because they're addicted or whatever, or they just don't care or not educated or there's no transparency, there's a numer- numerous reasons why consumers might not participate correctly if the investors you know the people who are at the top the high the people who are benefiting the most if they're not going to exert morality on the situation then yes it does rely on the shoulders i think of the producers to say enough is enough and and i don't have to you know, no one has to make you anything no one has to do anything for you but that is one of the things about capitalism i think people don't understand no one's forcing you to participate in it yep i mean you do have to eat and stuff like that so there is some survival that is at stake but like no one's stopping you from just like working together to like provide that for yourselves. And maybe they are. I don't know. There's probably, and that was one of the arguments like against unionization is like, this is voluntary. If you don't like this company, just go somewhere else. You have a tech job that makes Mm -hmm. really great wages. And so like, you could just move to another industry even and and find a job, but, and they're right. But the funny thing is that argument can be used against them because you could say, 
if everyone said, okay, cool, we're all going to not, then suddenly they'd be like, wait, 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 no, please. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Come back. And that's the power that laborers, I think, need to realize they have. It's collectively they have a lot of power. Real quick, though, I do want to be a little speculative with this, too, and just say that, like, uh, you know, we've seen, the thing is, like, art exists everywhere, no matter what the, you know, society is, no matter what systems are in place. Like, we've always seen art, humanity's, like, propensity for making experiences is something that never goes away and under the most brutal dictatorships or monarchies we still saw artwork and there were different ways in which those things were patronized right and one of the ones i wanted to draw attention to is there was a really awesome in my theater education i learned that there was a really awesome like basically like government funded system that would basically just like invest in theater like in germany this is before video games or movies Uh, And they basically just like it was literally like there was an entire like government organization that was like, we need to make sure that our country is producing art for the sake of it. And they would just Mm -hmm. invest in people who were making good art. And we had something similar to that in America, actually, at one point. It's called the National Endowment of the Arts. And it has been stripped to the point of uselessness. But governments can decide that they value this. The people Mm -hmm. can decide that they value this. And it doesn't matter what economic system you have. If it's valuable to the people, then it's valuable to invest in you know so you could i think you could see it in socialism again like if socialism were to suddenly if everyone were suddenly like flip a switch and now suddenly we're socialists right we stop participating in capitalism the capitalist systems all fall apart and all the means of production fall into the hands of the people which is what socialism is i think Mm -hmm. people would be like okay great like let's get all the best game developers together and like give them what they need you know if they just had their livelihoods taken care of by the collective right by the people whether it was through the government or just through people organizing it for them and you know exchanging sort of that barter service kind of like well you know i'm really good at this so i'm gonna make food for everybody or i'm i'm really good at uh i'm really good at building stuff so i'm gonna build houses for everybody right like if everyone started doing that and just sort of participating as a collective then like yeah of course we'd be like okay let's get the best game designers the best developers together and let's start getting them to make stuff games for us and you kind of like prove your value and your role that way and again i know that that's a sort of like again that may be a communist dream so to speak but it is i think like at least can i don't know it sounds like it could work it sounds good on paper and uh i think would i mean think about how different that would be and what kinds of different experiences we'd get if they didn't have to like please shareholders if all they had to do is please the people then like i think we get some pretty cool experiences personally mm-hmm. so yeah i think it could exist in other systems i don't know what the perfect solution is uh, by all intents and purposes like almost all economic systems we've never seen pure capitalism we've never seen pure socialism or communism in you know in any society in all of history every system is a hybrid system in america we have socialism in the form of the postal service and the military and the um the education and some some of our services are socially provided and some of them are capitalistically provided Mm -hmm. and even like communist party of china they're not fully communist they have private organizations they also have private organizations that work in concert with government organizations government socialist organizations effectively so it's uh it's a you know everything's kind of hybrid so i think just more hybridization figuring out the ways in which we can apply like unions are kind of a form of socialism uh applying Mm -hmm. unions and their power to uh the gaming industry is, is great I mean, ultimately, I just put it in the form of like, we need a greater restraints on capitalism in general. Yes. But so, yeah, we could, you know, and you mentioned how like the ESA was a great example of like the government not getting involved. And I think at the time that was good because the government didn't understand it. But imagine the government full of people who do understand the gaming industry, who do understand, have played video games their whole life and value them. If the government decided to put together a, you know, department of, you know, like gaming technology or whatever and like started investing in that that would be awesome and started investing and involving itself with making laws to protect the workers and to make sure that the best quality is determined i mean that's what alexander hamilton wanted right Mm -hmm. like if he had lived long enough he was going to try to create systems that would basically like be the government forcing standards of quality Mm -hmm. on products and that like we totally could use that but yeah, it's uh, so like I think that the government could be more involved in a positive way. And, you know, again, we need to empower consumers. We need to empower especially the ethical consumers to, you know, not only make their voices heard, but make change. And yeah, labor, labor needs labor needs to also be able to organize effectively and they need to be empowered, feel empowered to do so. So we need to stop efforts like Activision Blizzard from preventing a labor union from forming there. Honestly, I saw some idea recently that was like, we need like a member of the labor unions on every board in every like every shareholder board in every corporation in america needs a union representative there that can veto things (laughs) that has power to say no 
that does not benefit the workers that does not mm-hmm. benefit your employees and to say think of another solution to your problem of profit right so cool all right i think that we can end there it's ooh, great long conversation but it was a good conversation i think and like we said it's so big and there's so much to talk about so if any of you are left listening after this and aren't like offended and storming off into the night <laughs> in rage because we either didn't go far enough in our criticism of capitalism or we went too far uh and wounded your ego and identity as a whatever <laughs> <laughs> American. Then, uh, that you was not our it. intent we we wanted to discuss this and we both have pretty strong feelings about it and think that it's uh but most of all think that it's an interesting conversation and so we're glad that you're still here if you are and if you've run off into the night we hope you come back but if you do come back and want to share your thoughts with uh, us about capitalism in general or capitalism as it relates to the video game industry termite where can they share those thoughts and feedback if they you- have them can go to 80bitpodsmash.com 80bit podsmash that is our landing website with links to all of our social media outlets facebook instagram twitter and reddit as well as links to our discord server in all of the show notes where you can find us you can talk to us you can start your own subreddit conversation you can comment on a, a post on any of those platforms and get all of your feedback to us we love interacting with our audience we love hanging out so please let us know across any of those entries 80bitpodsmash.com. All right. Next week, uh, between the holidays, we're going to do part two of our Souls and Rogues episode, Souls Like and Rogues Likes. And this time, we're actually going to talk about Rogue Likes because we didn't have time to cover it in our Souls episode because we talked about that too long. So we're going to do the Rogue Like portion of it and we'll talk, we'll cover those questions that we weren't able to cover. So we'll talk about like direct comparisons and contrasts between the two. So if you haven't listened to that Souls Like episode in a while, you should brush that one off. Um, but we're also going to talk about roguelikes and kind of cover those, give those the spot in the sun that it deserves. And then after that is our New Year's episode. So we hope you all have a Merry Christmas since that's coming up. And uh, it's coming up this week. So please, please, please spend time with your families. Please, please, please take it easy. Take your mind off of work uh, if, you're, if you're able to, if you're enabled to. Uh, and just hold close to your family. Hold tight to your loved ones because um, that's what the season's all about. I wish you and your family and friends, chosen family, a wonderful holiday season. I hope it is filled with lots and lots of joyful conversations and none of the family stress that it can bring. And we wish you a happy new year if you don't come around between now and the end of the year. And we'll see you in 2022 or next week. <laughs>